Okay, hi everyone. My name is Jessica, and today I'm going to present a health equity approach to mass vaccination plans in Canada. So before I begin, I want to acknowledge that this presentation and my community report were prepared on the traditional territory lands of the Mississauga of the Credit. This land is also home to the Anishabek, the Huron-Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, the Ojibwe people, the Métis, and the Mississauga of the Credit First Nation. I would also like to acknowledge my practicum supervisor, Dr. Frank Walsh, as well as my practicum counselors, Dr. Nigel Livingston and Dr. Karen Vulture for all of their guidance and encouragement with regards to my projects. Okay, so today's presentation will be broken into two components. The first addressing my role at the Canadian Public Health Association and the second addressing the findings in my culminating report. Okay, so my role at the Canadian Public Health Association, CPHA. So CPHA is a non-governmental organization that works to operate, that works to inform decision-making with evidence-based data. My role thus involved preparing evidence-based documents. I specifically worked with the team to prepare a COVID-19 response and recovery paper that explored the relationship between COVID-19 and the social determinants of health. This was really interesting because not only did it align with my goals of assessing pandemic plans, but also with my goals of supporting equity, social justice, respect, and cultural humility. I also worked to independently prepare a vaccination piece within the COVID-19 paper that examined the influence of Canada's vaccine capacity, prioritization, hesitancy, distribution, and availability of immunization clinics on vaccine accessibility and uptake. So as I began to explore um, Canada's vaccine response, I began to question whether plans were true to equity goals of supporting vaccination in all populations. So to answer this, I needed to evaluate whether the current vaccine response had an equity component that adequately addressed inequities. Since COVID-19 team plans were kind of still in progress, I decided to explore past humanization events as they allowed me to assess where and why inequities existed in the past and whether they were being addressed in the current vaccine plan. So in this study, I explored the poliomyelitis epidemics and the H1N1 pandemic as they were the two most recent large-scale humanization events for uh, viral, viral infections in Canada. Okay, so data on the disease events were obtained by conducting a four-step literature review. So the first step involved devising search terms. So search terms are different for each disease under study, but commonly explored terms such as vaccine, vaccination, immunization, equity in Canada. These terms were then put into a database and then searched for relevance. Articles were basically screened for whether they addressed equity and vaccination in high-risk groups. Any relevant articles were then summarized and reported. Okay, so the first disease explored was poliomyelitis, also known as polio. So polio is an infectious disease that is caused by the polio virus. Um, upon infections, individuals can display a range of symptoms ranging from mild flus to infections such as paresthesia, meningitis, and paralysis. So between 1910 and 1994, Canada experienced actual multiple epidemics of polio, with 1953 being one of the worst recorded years with 9,000 cases and 500 deaths. So outbreaks were thought to uh, result from a multitude of factors, including improved sanitary conditions and um, gaps in immunizations that basically cultivated groups of non-immune individuals. So populations most at risk at the time were the middle-class family um, and treatments at the time were rehabilitations with the inactivated and oral polio vaccines becoming available after the 1950s. So what did we find in terms of equity? So polio's vaccine response so strengthened acknowledging that population immunity could only be achieved once everyone had access to the vaccine. This was seen through its effort to support national and global immunization programs. Um, in terms of weaknesses, there was actually very limited data exploring vaccination in high-risk groups, which was expected since equity wasn't prioritized or even considered at the time. So however, gaps in vaccinations can still be inferred from findings of systemic, neglect, systemic discrimination and neglect. For example, in the Eastern Arctic region of Canada, despite Inuit and Indigenous individuals facing persistent outbreaks and high case and mortality rates, um, we see that um, help wasn't actually sent until non-Indigenous individuals became infected. So we also see cases of discrimination with many blaming the spread of polio on the Indigenous way of living. Um, there was instead no consideration for why the crowded and contaminated conditions that existed in these Indigenous communities, as well as those socioeconomic communities, and that facilitated spread um, were not examined, nor how these social conditions affected vaccination. Okay, oops. 
Okay, so with the polio epidemic now analyzed, we will now discuss the H1N1 pandemic that occurred between 2009-2010. So H1N1 is a severe respiratory illness caused by the influenza type A virus. The pandemic has resulted in a total of about 40 40,000 yeah, 40, cases in Canada and 428 deaths. So examples of population at risk included pregnant women, children, Indigenous individuals, and those with chronic issues. So treatments at the time included the initial use of an antiviral treatment with the H1N1 unadjuvanted and adjuvanted vaccines becoming available during the second wave. So what do we find for equity during the H1N1 pandemic? So in terms of strengths, we do see now the inclusion of an equity component in an analytical framework used to evaluate vaccination plans, which is the Erickson DeWalls analytical framework. Unfortunately, while the framework considers equity, it doesn't really provide any way to assess equity. The H1N1 pandemic was also better in its ability to prioritize indigenous communities for vaccines and resources. So while there were improvements, there were still issues of neglect in both indigenous and rationalized communities. Studies demonstrated that issues such as lack of vaccine resources, high crime rates, racism, lack of ethnic doctors, and no paid time off created hindrances in vaccine uptake. Um, in addition, we have issues of stigma, which were also evident with halts in vaccination occurring in high-risk groups such as inmates and obese individuals because they were seen as undeserving for the vaccine. Neglect and discrimination play a huge role on vaccine hesitancy, with many individuals unwilling to seek vaccinations because they lack trust in the healthcare system, and they're angry at the government for not addressing pressing issues. Um, articles recommend engaging community leaders and organizations to inform and lead the entire vaccination process rather than to just consult it. Okay, so what were the major themes? So systemic discrimination and neglect were not addressed in any of the disease events. As I have mentioned, this has implications on vaccine hesitancy in communities. Now, the only question we have left to ask is whether the COVID-19 vaccination plan addressed these factors. The answer is somewhat. So while we do see that Canada is making a commitment to include diverse groups in an equity matrix through the EEFA framework that examines vaccine accessibility according to the social conditions defined by the progress plus variables, which will be discussed later. And while we do see a commitment to supply vaccines globally, the plan still does not address the role of neglect and systemic discrimination that still exists and is arising. For example, while we acknowledge the rise in Asian hate crimes, there's no evaluation for how this would affect vaccine hesitancy and uptake amongst the Asian population. Accordingly, as we kind of progress into the digital world, there's also an arising issue of how individuals that cannot afford quality internet services or devices would be able to book a vaccine appointment or be able to participate in public consultations regarding the vaccine. Okay, so my recommended equity framework. So while the Equity matrix assesses diverse populations and equities are viewed as one dimensional and not really explored to the different levels of society. So I was, I was exploring vaccine um, models. I was inspired to stratify the progress plus variables highlighted in yellow, according to the levels in the social ecological model, which are highlighted in green. So including this model will not only help with identifying where inequities, especially those caused by systemic discrimination exist, but it allows us to explore how their interactions may influence uptake. For example, we can understand how organizational racism influences um, individual interpersonal and political decisions towards vaccine uptake. Um, this model also contains a global equity piece which um, ensures that global commitment to vaccination is supported beyond just the supply of vaccines, so that we're actually supporting infrastructure as well. Okay, so in conclusion, the major takeaway for this presentation is that equitable access to vaccines means more than just increasing the presence of clinics. Access does not equate to availability. Equity is an ongoing process, and if we want to facilitate vaccination in groups, we need to consider the social determinants and pay closer attention to how years of neglect and discrimination have hindered access. Thank you. Okay, questions.